Today is the 24th of October, 2008. We are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. And uh, today we are interviewing uh, Mr. Cheryl Reinhardt. Uh, Mr. Reinhardt, for the record, could you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Cheryl Thomas Reinhardt. Born September 1924 in Elmira, New York. Okay. Did you uh, attend school in Elmira? Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, did you graduate from high school? Yes, I did. Okay. And what year did you graduate? 1943. Okay. And do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I was was working part-time for Armour Meat Packing Company at that time and um, I had sustained an injury and was uh, in the hospital mm -hmm. when, on the Sunday, uh, that Sunday morning. Okay. You know, Mark. And what was your reaction? Did you, uh, at the time, did you think we were going to war or did you hear rumors to that effect? Yeah. Okay. Sure. I think we all felt at that point that something was going to happen, something drastic was going to happen. Okay. And uh, you graduated from high school in 1943? Yes, as a matter of fact, because I always like to tell the story, I graduated in June, June 22nd of 1943. And at that time, of course, we had, had already registered for the draft at uh -huh. age 18. <clears throat> I was at Samson Naval Training Station in two weeks. Okay, so you were drafted? Yes. Okay. All right. And uh, what was Samson like back then? Samson was a fabulous place. Uh -huh. I'm very familiar with it because I've been involved in a uh, museum which has been established there also. Okay. And uh, yes, Samson was. Was tremendous. Uh, it had five training units, um, all about, well, almost exactly the same. They were made up of 22 barracks, mm -hmm. a drill hall that was enormous, 600 feet long, 125 feet wide, huge, uh, mess hall, uh, ship service, and two medical buildings plus the administrative buildings in each unit. And each unit held about roughly 4,000 men. Mm -hmm. And there were five of them. So in round numbers, there could be 20,000 guys in, in training uh, at the same time at Samson. It was huge. Samson was a huge base. Okay, was that your first time away from home? Oh, no, not really. Okay. Well, on a more permanent basis, yes. Okay. And how long were you at Samson? Uh, my, my boot training at that point um, went from either from uh, six weeks to 12 weeks. It depended a lot on what the need was out there. Uh -huh. my, my, my boot training was eight weeks. Okay. And uh, after you completed your boot training, did you go for any additional training anywhere? No, but I got a very lucky break. Um, I only lived 55 miles. Samson was 55 miles from Elmira. Okay. <clears throat> so after boot, on my boot leave, of course, went home. And while I was there, I met a um, policeman in town that I always I had known for a long time. And he was a chief uh, petty officer at Samson. And he was in charge of what they called the Seaman Guard. The Seaman Guard was kind of a branch of the Shore Patrol. The Shore Patrol was external of the base, and the Seaman Guard was the guard internal of the base. Okay. <clears throat> so he asked me if I'd like to spend three months at Samson in the Seaman Guard, and I said, certainly. <laughs> so he arranged for me to go into the Seaman Guard, and. Um, my job was, I was Sar sergeant in arms, I remember that. My job was to, with a bus and a station wagon, uh, 
take the latches out to the posts mm -hmm. all throughout the base and pick up the guys that were already there. And, and um, then I go back and have caught. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was a uh, that was a, a lucky break in, in 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 more than one way. Uh, it put me back uh, uh -huh. a ways so that I missed some some very important um, things that I would have normally probably have been involved in. Okay. Now, did, were there ever any problems or incidents during that time? No. Nothing out of the ordinary happened on base, or? Well, one story I've always liked to tell um, there too is that we would go up to the railroad station in Geneva, New York, to pick up the payroll. <clears throat> and at one point in time, and we went up there all armed in station wagons and other military vehicles. But we, one day we went up and we picked up the payroll and on the way back we had to cross a railroad track. Mm -hmm. the, the officer in charge was a, was a, a young ensign and uh, as we got to this railroad track the, the train came along and held us up with with thousands of dollars and bags of money. And, and this, this ensign got very, very excited. He didn't know what to do, except that we, we didn't really have a choice except to sit there and wait for the train. Mm -hmm. And he put us all in, with our guns cocked and everything. We really yeah. felt, felt like we were big guns at that point. <clears throat> Otherwise, no, there, there was no, uh, no unusual uh, happenings in my life at Samson. Okay. And after Samson, where did you go next? Uh, I, to Little Creek, Virginia, where I was assigned to the amphibious, Navy amphibious forces. Okay. And did you get any training there? Not, not an awful lot. It wasn't until we actually were assigned to a ship we we okay. got any kind of training. Oh, we had the, the, the some of the basic the basic training, like in in uh, handling handguns and and kind of uh, normal stuff. Uh, okay. But not not no special no special training at that time. Okay. And then eventually you were assigned to a ship. Yes. As a matter of fact, I was assigned to an LST, landing ship tank. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was number 518, it was called the Nestor, N-E-S-T-O-R. Uh, we were sent to Seneca, Illinois, which was a small, very small town southwest of Chicago. And I'm not sure what river it was on. It, at this point, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm really not really forgotten about that. Um, but at any rate, there was a small shipyard that was dedicated to building LSTs in Seneca, Illinois. When the ship was finished and, and christened, uh, we took it down the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I suppose at this point it would be all to know and the reason we could do that is there was no keel on an LST. They were all flat bottom, flat bottom boats with no keel. We took it down the Mississippi, went around into the Caribbean and around Florida and up into Baltimore. And they were going to do something special with that ship. And to this day, I don't know what the special was. But it needed additional work to be done on it, mm -hmm. of a very special nature. So we left the ship there and went back down to uh, Little Creek and Solomons, Maryland, where the, we were reassigned to another ship, another LST. Okay. All right. And uh, once you are reassigned, what, where did you go next? Okay, that one, that ship, that LST was was uh, 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 
launched in um, the Hingham shipyard outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, was this a, a new LST? This is a new LST, it was the LST 907. Okay. So we were shipped up to Boston, and at that point, we started to get some training, very specific training, depending on what we, what we had been assigned to do. For instance, I was assigned to it as a gun captain on a 20 millimeter Grand Sky aircraft. And at that point, we were taken out to the coast of Rhode Island and uh, received uh, training on, on, on the 20, mil 20 millimeter guns. Okay. Uh, uh, did you shoot at uh, targets, towed targets? Yes, or? targets that were flown right up the coast. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The ship was christened uh, in April of 44. We went on a training cruise in the Chesapeake Bay for a couple of weeks, and then on down to Norfolk, Virginia, mm -hmm. where we loaded for the first time um, and shipped out. That was the 2nd of June, 1944. Okay, so you're a plank holder then, correct? Is that what they call it, a, a plank holder, because you're one of the original yes. crew members? Yes, Okay. That's correct. And, uh, okay, you you loaded at that point, what, what did you load aboard ship? Uh, we, loaded, we loaded and unloaded so many times in the next year, I can't remember. Okay. But, uh, our prime, the prime objective was an LST, of an LST, was to move equipment and personnel. Mm -hmm. So we loaded, we loaded uh, all kinds of equipment. I don't remember exactly what they were. Okay. And several uh, units of the military, Army, and we also took a, an LCT, an LCT, it's much smaller uh, invasion craft, amphibious craft, and we could carry the LCT on our deck. Oh. So we, we had an LCT on deck, and when we were ready to, to, to take off for Europe. Okay, and, and do you recall when that was? June 2nd, 1944. Okay. We crossed the Atlantic on the northern route in a convoy of a, over 100 ships. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not a pleasant experience either weather-wise. That was in that northern route in the winter, or in any time it yeah. was. Did you get seasick at all? I I was fortunate enough so that no, I did not. Uh, there were many, many guys that did. It was <laughs> it was a common thing. Uh, we arrived in the Mediterranean in about 21 days, as I recall. Okay. And we went directly to the eastern end of the Mediterranean. To what used to be some type of military base, the base was then called Karuba, um, and that's where our, where we first landed uh, and and, and uh, discharged all of the equipment and people. Okay. And how long were you there for? <clears throat> From there on, it was. I, I honestly don't remember that particularly, that timing particularly. But f from that point on, we moved continually. Mm -hmm. We would we would load up the, the ship, and we would move to the next port, and we would uh, disperse our load, and then we would go somewhere else and pick up some more. And so we hit actually hit uh, about twenty three. I recall 23 or 25 ports in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. All right. And uh, you mentioned uh, the invasion to uh, southern France? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Did you land at Normandy? No. No, no. Uh, we did, we, that's one of the things I mentioned. 
by being in Chip's company when, back when I was in the Seaman Guard that set me back three okay. months. I miss, we missed Normandy. Okay. We, we left the second, we left the, the United States in the second of June right. and Normandy was the sixth of June. Right. So we got that word by radio. Okay. Uh, now, you were under fire at one point? Yeah, there were several occasions where we would we would be under fire, uh, 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 under air 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 cover. Okay. The um, I mentioned that we actually followed the. We were again very fortunate. The timing was so fortunate because we were following the major thrust as it went out of Africa to Sicily to Italy. And all the way up through Italy, we were always behind that, but moving, keep moving troops and uh -huh. equipment up as the as those invasions of Anzio and Palermo or uh, Palermo and and uh, I can't remember the name of the other city in Italy. But uh, so we <clears throat> when we got when when the forces got up north of, of Naples or into the northern Italy was then, it was very obvious what the next major step was going to be, and that was southern France. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, it, by that time, and this was in August, right? by that time, in those two months, the, 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 the forces that had gone into, uh, into Normandy were doing a m miraculous job of, of, of forcing the, the Germans back, mm -hmm. and it was obvious that we had to get them, we were going to get them from the south as well. So we formed a, an invasion task force in the Bay of Naples starting about the 1st of August. Um, it, was, it was a huge invasion force too, not, not, not anywhere near as big as Normandy was, but mm -hmm. it was, I remember being, going on Liberty in Naples and looking down over the bay, and it almost looks like you could walk across the whole bay because there were so many ships mm -hmm. in, in that in, in the Bay of Naples. What was Naples itself like then? <clears throat> had they been hit hard by, by war? Naples, Naples had been uh, utterly destroyed. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was not a very pleasant thing uh, for the city uh, as beautiful as that city was. It, it, it was it was bad. Did you have much contact with the people there? Only only street people. Mm -hmm. We'd go on Liberty, and of course, in those in those days, uh, the big thing was to the people was cigarettes and candy and things like that that we had access to, and you could buy almost anything with a pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. In fact, I am. Uh, one day I was out. And met a, a man and, uh, and and his son, I think, it was. and the boy had a, a a trumpet with him. And I used to play the trumpet. In fact, all the way through school. So I, I bought the trumpet for a candy bar. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I took, excuse me. Took it back to the ship and used it. And I, and I actually used it for quite a while. Hmm. But. It, it was it was um, not a very nice scene to see the way people had to live after they'd been bombed out of their homes. Yeah. Now, uh, you at some point became a cook aboard ship. Oh yes, um, that happened before we left. Um, I went at, I went we went on a training cruise. Um, and at that point, no assignments or very few assignments had been made. Mm -hmm. And they took us out on the deck, and, and this is in January. And, uh, they're going to teach us how to throw lines. So that when we, if we were seamen, we'd be out on deck and tying the ship up and not yeah. doing that kind of thing. And so we would throw the lines overboard. And when we brought them back in, they'd be ice. I said to a friend of mine who I went in with, a good buddy of mine from high school, 
I said, George, I don't know about you, but I don't think I want to live this kind of life. So at that point, they were asking for um, what we called mess cooks. That would be somebody in the galley that would do KP duty. Uh -huh. I said, I think we ought to go volunteer to do KP duty. <laughs> so, so we did. And that led to my being a cook. Uh -huh. So I was a cook from, from the time, pretty much the time, well, after we picked up the 907. Uh -huh. Now you, you received on-the-job training for that? Yep. I learned to cook from two great guys. Uh, one, uh, well, the, we had a chief commissary officer and a uh, uh, first class first class cook and a second class cook and they were great guys and, and they taught me how to they taught me everything I knew mm -hmm. how many guys uh, did you have to cook for aboard ship it averaged 135 to 150 that is the crew mm -hmm. when we carried troops uh, it could obviously get much larger than now, in some cases, we actually fed the troops. If we had enough food aboard and the numbers of troops would fit that pattern, um, we would feed the troops also. If there were, we, we did that fairly often. We carried, I think the largest number of, of troops that we carried at any one time was about 500. Mm -hmm. But the crew itself was, which, whom were very well fed. We had great food, mm -hmm. generally. Did you did you have fresh food or was most oh, of Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Every time we went into port, our commissary officers would go out and find if they could find fresh food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your typical day like? I mean like if you were cooking for that many men, did you have to get up at like two o'clock in the morning to start <laughs> preparing breakfast and our watch was 24 on and 24 off, and it started after dinner, noon dinner. Mm -hmm. We would, that's when our watch started. So okay. we would cook supper, breakfast the next day, and dinner. Clean up the galley, then we were off for 24 hours. Okay. So yes, when you had the watch, uh, we were up at four, four or five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So you had to stay awake for 24 hours every other day, basically. Well, we, didn't have to st we still went to bed. We, oh, okay. But, but the watch would wake us up at whatever time we told them to, and we would, we would prepare breakfast and, and dinner, mm -hmm. and then we'd go off to. Okay. All right. And uh, did you uh, get to see any sort of USO shows or anything? while you were in port? No, as a matter of fact, I never saw any shows as such. Um, we visited several uh, in the major cities like Naples and Marseille, um, Leghorn, Italy. Uh, we visited USO clubs uh -huh. and, or, or Red Cross facilities of one type or another. But I never really got to see a, a, a USO show. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? You know, that's one thing I do not remember. Okay. I, I remember, obviously, that it happened, but I just do not remember. Okay. When I have a log, I kept a log that uh, daily activity and I know that's in I, I know that's in the log but it just does not come to my mind at this point okay um, are there any other incidents you'd like to speak about uh, any of the air raids or or any of the um, any of the personnel aboard ship uh, officers friends etc you mentioned uh, uh, Dale Morgan, was he the skipper? D Dale Morgan was the skipper. He was a lieutenant <clears throat> when we first went aboard and eventually became a lieutenant commander. Uh, Dale was a, an extremely gifted man. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
he, uh, he handled the crew beautifully, and uh, he was really a great guy. One story I'd love to tell about Captain Morgan was that uh, one day he used to come down to the galley for his coffee instead of getting it in the officer's quarters. He liked to get it right out of the, the uh, big urn in the galley. Mm -hmm. So he'd come down to the galley quite often and get his coffee. One day he came in and got his coffee, and he looked at me. I happened to be on duty that day. He looked at me and he said, Reinhardt, you ever think you'll amount to a dam? And I looked at him and I thought, whoa, I don't know what to do with this one. So I kind of shrugged my shoulders and, and didn't spiss it. Uh, turned around and walked away. So he kept doing this to me. Every once in a while, he'd say, look at me, Reinhardt, you ever think you'll amount to a dam? And then he'd walk away. Well, it didn't take me too long to figure out what he was trying to do. And I remember waking up one, one night, during the night, and thinking about this. And I thought, oh, I know what he's doing. So the next time he did it, same thing, Reinhardt, you ever think he'll amount to a dam? I snapped to attention, saluted him, and said, yes, sir. He never said a word, he got a big smile on his face, turned around, walked away. Never heard from him. I've never heard it again. Hmm. He was he was a guy that really knew how to deal with people. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of respect for Dale Morgan. In fact, I saw him uh, a couple of times after after the war. Uh, he was a lawyer in, uh, in, uh, with a very f big law firm in Boise, Idaho, and really enjoyed that, played golf with him. And it was, he became a good friend. Oh. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were when the war in Europe ended? Oh, absolutely. We got the news. We were in Lake Horn, Italy. Got the news, and we were ready to take off uh, to Ajaccio, Corsica. We had a load of, uh, of, of equipment and so on. So when we got to Ajaccio, the town was absolutely riotous because <laughs> everyone was so happy that this, the news had broken there and, and so, so we were allowed to, we got a special liberty that night and were allowed to go out and celebrate. Okay, um, once, once the war had ended, okay, and you're over in, you're over in Europe, what happened next? I mean, did you, uh, start loading troops to take them back to the states or no we kept uh, let's see that was in that was in may but we had we still had work to do uh, mm -hmm. we 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 moved after that we still moved equipment and troops uh, mm -hmm. and at, at that point in time our major uh, landing area was south, was marseille was mm -hmm. the port because the invasion had taken place just to the east of Marseille, down on the French Riviera, as a matter of fact. So we still had a lot of, of trips back and forth between all these ports. Oran, Africa, was a major port for us. Uh, and many times we went from Oran to Marseille and back and forth. And back and forth. Was there any talk or scuttlebutt about going to uh, Japan? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We, we fully expected that we would go home when we went home. Mm -hmm. that we would be reassigned to, um, to Japan. Um, something happened there that, that held us up a little bit. We were in Oran all ready to come home. In fact, the ship had been loaded for us to come home. And that was in June of 45. 45. And um, I'm not quite sure. I remember that it had to do with Tito. Some some trouble broke up, broke out in uh, Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and it was Tito based and his guerrillas and so on. And I, I honestly don't remember the the whole political structure of what was going on. But at any rate, they said, "Well, we, they need 
support up there. So we, we unloaded, the, the, there was a, about six LS, LSTs that were going to go home together. So they unloaded all the six LSTs, reloaded them with British troops, and we went up into the Adriatic Sea all the way to Trieste. Uh, at that point, we unloaded and I remember the ship was sitting at a parallel to the, to the main uh, street, actually, a, a major street of the city. And we had our duty was, um, we had our anti-aircraft guns pointed right at the, the, the city streets. Uh, and, but nothing, nothing really, there, oh, there was a little bit of activity with, with tank fire and that type of thing, but nothing that involved us. So we loaded back up again and went back to Oran and loaded up again there for the mm -hmm. trip home. And we made one stop uh, as we came home, and that was in Casablanca to pick up some other um, equipment and troops. And uh, we, we arrived home late July. Now, now by, by home, we're, we're about? New here. York City. Okay. We were scheduled to go into dry, dry dock in Bayonne, New Jersey, from which at, at that point we were to get our 30-day leave, mm -hmm. which, was no, which was normal at that point. Well, there was no room in New York, in Bayonne, so we went down to, we moved down to Portsmouth, Virginia, and, New, and uh, Norfolk, Virginia. No room there. Down to Miami, no room there. Mobile, Alabama, no room there. We ended up in Houston, Texas, where we got our 30-day leave from. <laughs> so I was six hours from home in New York <laughs> and about 60 hours from home by train in Houston, Texas. <clears throat> but we got our 30-day leave was actually during the, the month of August. Mm -hmm. So I was home uh, when we heard the news about VJ Day. Uh -huh. Was there a lot of celebration uh -huh. at home? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was at my sister's home in Skinny Atlas, New York, uh, when we got the news. And uh, we all went into Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a, just a wonderful, wonderful event. Now, how long had you been away from home? Um, at the point you got your 30-day leave, how long had it been since you'd seen your family? Obviously, it was probably over a year. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh well, we were overseas yeah. for 14 months. Okay. And before that, it would been, had been several months, I believe. I would say 18 months, Okay. roughly. Okay. All right. Uh, once your 30 days of leave were up, did you have to report back to Houston? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, we actually reported. The ship, in the meantime, was taken to um, New Orleans, where it was to be rehabbed, re-camouflaged, um, and other whatever repair work or maintenance work they had to do on it. And it was re-camouflaged, so we were, we were no question about we were going to the Pacific mm -hmm. until, obviously, BJ put a stop to that. Okay. So uh, we, we went back to New Orleans and picked up the ship there. Um, the only event after that that I remember very vividly was the fact that in October, w w we normally celebrated Navy Day. <clears throat> and this was an annual event for years and years. Well, the military said, we want every possible ship that we can be put into a port, we want put it into different ports around the country for mm -hmm. Navy Day. So we were assigned to Paducah, Kentucky. So we went up the river again, all the way to, and Paducah is, I believe, I believe is on the Ohio River, I'm not really sure, that, but anyway, we went up to Paducah, Kentucky. We beached the ship. In, in the river on the shore of Paducah, Kentucky, mm -hmm. just as if we would beach, have beached the ship in an invasion. Yep. 
opened the bow doors and the ramp and so on. And we were there for a week for, for the people of, of Paducah to come aboard and, and see what the NLST was all about. Mm -hmm. And they did that throughout the whole country okay. on, on Navy Day in 1945. Okay. And uh, where did you go next? Were you discharged shortly after <coughs> that? Or? Yeah, I was just, that was in October. And we were on the point system at that point to, to determine when, when our discharge would take place. Um, I don't remember too much about the time between Paducah and, and the time I got discharged. Okay. I, we ended up, we spent a lot of time in Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And that's where I, I was, left the ship in Norfolk, Virginia in April. Uh, 1946, April 29th, and went to, um, I was discharged, and I went to Lido Beach, Long Island, mm -hmm. I was discharged from there. Okay, and uh, what rank did you attain I while you were in the service? second class. Okay, all right, uh, once you were discharged, uh, did you uh, make use of the GI Bill? I did. Mm -hmm. I. I could honestly say, say that, that probably it was one of the big, big mistakes of my life. I did not um, go on to get my degree. I did. I used it to go to school. I went to a business school in Rochester, New York. Um, but uh, yes, I did. Okay. And did you use the uh, GI Bill to, to buy a home? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Did home you? I lived in, in for 30 years in Rochester. All right. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Oh yes. Originally the American Legion and then the VFW. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that eventually kind of petered out. It it lost. I, it seems to me, you know, it was quite a active immediately after the war for some time, and then kind of slowed down and, and, and I didn't have any interest in that. Too many other things, raising a family and, mm -hmm. and you know, got me looking for work and going, getting a new job and so on, okay. all got, got in the way of that. Were you married or engaged uh, during the time you were in the service no. or did that come after? No. That happened then. Okay. And uh, did you uh, stay in touch with anyone you were in the service with? Oh yes, oh yes. Um, several years later, one of our men who lived in Fairfield, Ohio, so Cincinnati, tried to get a hold of as many guys as he could that were on the 907. And to make a long story short, we eventually started a reunion group. And we've over, I think we had 20, 22 or 23 consecutive reunions mm -hmm. starting in 1985. And going through just just a couple of years ago, uh -huh. we get together once a year, and all over we uh, we had guys that were active in this group from Duluth, Minnesota, from North and Florida South, uh, the coastal area to well, probably Cincinnati was the farthest west. We didn't have anyone, there were men we had been in contact with that lived west of the Mississippi, but we didn't have any attendees at the, at the reunions. Mm -hmm. How many guys are left? Right now, our active roster is, that we know about, is oh, maybe 15. Mm -hmm. We started out with about 40, 40 to 50 guys. Mm -hmm. But some of them, it's like high school reunions, some of them didn't go for that type of thing. Yeah. They came to the first one and said, well, it's nice to see you guys, <laughs> but we probably won't be back. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Well, there's no question about the fact that it 
it, it helped me re mature quite rapidly. <laughs> um, I, I look upon my almost three years in the service as one of the best things that ever happened to me in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there any, anything else you'd like to add in closing? Yeah, one, one small world story that I'd like sure. to tell. <clears throat> um, our quartermaster, w w which in the Navy was a navigator, his name was Ed Edward Duffy. And uh, Duffy and I knew each other, of course, aboard ship. Just got along fine. And, and uh, years later, and I, I had only seen him once uh, after the war, <clears throat> until 19, in 1975, I believe, my son uh, decided that he was going to go to St. Lawrence University up in Canton, Canton, New York. So that all materialized, and we took Greg up to up to St. Lawrence to a dorm. He had been assigned to a quad room in a dorm. Mm -hmm. The next, we got there first, and the next person in <clears throat> was a young man with his mother, and his name was Ed Duffy. So, but he was, uh, the Duffy I knew was from the Utica, Rome area. Mm -hmm. This Duffy, young, young man Duffy, was from East Aurora, New York. So I said to him, you know, I was on the, I was in the Navy with a guy by the name of Ed Duffy, but I said he was from the Utica Rome area. Duffy Jr. said, my dad was from the Utica Rome area. I said, I was on the LST 907. He said, my dad was on the LST 907. Those two boys got signed to the same room hmm. in, the, in 1975 after all that time. And it's another, another side of the... Uh, now, was he still living at that that point, or had he... Oh, oh yeah, oh, okay. oh yeah, he's still living right now. As a matter of fact, he's a good friend of mine. Um, the, the, the side story to that one is Mrs. Duffy, Jean, um, said, well, when I go home, I'll have Duffy give me a call. And, and, I, and I said to her, what does he do? And she said he works for Marine Midland Corporation. So the next week, I got a phone call from Ed Duffy. And we talked, of course, and mm -hmm. brought each other up to date on our backgrounds and so on. So I said, w w what do you do at Marine Midland? He said, I'm president and CEO of Marine Midland Corporation. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> which, which was quite a surprise. And I, I still see him. In fact, I saw him since I've been here um, in Saratoga. His summer home is in uh, Cooperstown, New York, and mm -hmm. he spends the winters in uh, Florida. Uh, he's about an eight, and nine, and three now. He spends most of his time in Florida. Mm -hmm. But we've become very close friends. Wow. Now, uh, could you hold up that f uh, photograph and tell us uh, when and where that was taken? Uh, I believe this was taken in Palermo, Sicily in 1945, I believe. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Uh, was there any... You, you put that down. Was, was there uh, anything else you'd like to touch on that we may have missed? No, I don't believe so, Wayne. I think that pretty much tells the story of my Navy days. Okay, well, well thank you very much.